welcome to the podcast. Uh, this episode, we've got Lewis Cuomo. Lewis, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on, Don. That's right, mate. So, obviously, I've been speaking to you sort of quite a bit on Instagram because um, I've seen some of your captures, and I know they're sort of quite impressive and quite hard come by. And I wouldn't mind sort of digging into some of those. So, do you want to give us a little bit of an intro about? Um, about you and then we can sort of move on to those captures yeah sure thing um i'd say that probably to introduce myself uh, i'm an essex essex angler work as a primary school teacher um so at the minute i'm not getting the most time to to get out on the bank but in relation to the, the captures i was working at the reservoirs at walthamstow and uh yeah i had a bit more time on my hands then so i was, I was properly getting stuck in and um how did that come about? Obviously, you said you worked there. Is that was that your sort of first um, experience of, of those waters, or, or what? Um, no, so I've on and off fished um, the Stowe since well, since I was about eighteen, and I could drive there, so that's ten years. Mm-hmm. And in the last sort of four years, I've been retraining to become a primary school teacher, and obviously, I was getting huge summer holidays due to. Um, mm-hmm uni shuts down in sort of may time and you're not back there till september um so the summer prior to the one we just had i was i was fishing so much at the stow that i I got really friendly with the bailiffs and um it just so happened that a job was coming up one guy um was going on a sabbatical and the summer ranger was was taking his job so it left the summer ranger position open which is like a three-month job yeah yeah, so you were, um, well, they don't really come much better, I suppose, do they? <laughs> in terms of jobs, <laughs> to your carp fishing. <laughs> no, literally, it was a uh, right place, right time. Um, it was it was a really good job. Like, I'm so glad to have done it. It was it was great. Yeah, so talk um, talk to us a little bit about the uh, the sessions and how you got on. Uh, well, in, which in regards to which sessions, Dom? Right on um, the stow. I mean, we sort of talked a bit off mic. And then obviously Lockwood. So, do you want to talk about any of those? Um, well, I'd say that throwing it back to like early Stowe days, sort of like when mm. I was when I was only eighteen, which I said is like where it would be a good place to start. I mean, like that yeah. the Stowe then was was just like super hard. Those the lakes were so big; they were the biggest lakes I'd ever seen. Um, mm. And I just did a hell of a lot of blanking back then. <laughs> And kind of progressed through my like my Walthamstow career, so to speak, by fishing the number one first, as like so many people do, uh, moving on to the two and three, and and then finally like going across the road to some of the bigger ones. Hmm. What well, um, in terms of tactics and methods? Obviously, cause you said they were big old waters for you. How did how did you sort of step up? Is that I mean was that a complete rehaul of gear, or did you have the kit but you just didn't you know didn't have the knowledge? I suppose initially. Yeah, I, I just didn't. I, I think I had the kit because obviously those I had sort of like hundred pound rods and hundred pounds reels. Uh, they're enough to get you out there, but I just didn't have the knowledge, and you know, they just seemed so vast. And um, the fish move so fast in the reservoirs; it's not like normal fishing. And uh, probably another massive change was the shifting over to the days only like you've got to be on the ball back in the early mm. stow days i just i was not on the ball like i used to turn up at about 10 a.m considering the <laughs> gate opened at six and i'd leave i'd leave at 6 p.m so essentially i'd miss the best time in the morning and the best time in the evening and i suppose it's yeah. not a wonder i didn't catch anything <laughs> <laughs> and what um when did it all sort of start to go right for you or um obviously were you sort of learning each session yeah, definitely. I think um, it was uh, Walthamstow was very much like on and off. I'd fish it around other syndicates. Um, in the early days, it was like really hit and miss. And I used to see um, some of the guys over there, like Shaky and um, Tom Dove's uncle. I think his name's Scott Dove. Like, they just used to be haulers. Uh, I'd look at what they were doing, and uh, you know, just couldn't, couldn't, couldn't uh, master it. And then, sort of in about two thousand and seventeen, I think that. Yeah, 2017 there was a fish kill on the stow uh, everyone will know about that and they lost around mm-hmm. 650 carp and at that point i was like i have to go back now and, and give it a serious go get a season ticket and um catch some of these fish before they die because they're those kind of old school wolfram style iconic carp that 
definitely aren't going to be around forever. Yeah, yeah. And what, um, so at that point, would you sort of, not in terms, I don't mean sussed it, but had you sort of had a better idea of how to go about it? Was it less daunting? Obviously, I suppose we've a lot less fish in there. I mean, what changed there for you in your own angling? I think I'd just, I'd come on leaps and bounds within my own angling. Uh, like when I first went on there when I was 18, you know, I'd, I'd hadn't been cart fishing per se for so long. Um, and going back, uh, what would I have been like six, seven years later, I'd fished so many different lakes by then. I was just mm-hmm. much, much more competent angler, much more confident. And um, also I just re- started to realize the importance of being on the gate in the morning and I'm not. Obviously, I'm not sure how much people know, but the Walthamstow Way is first come, first serve. So sometimes you have to get on the gate an hour or two before it opens up. Not not so much mm-hmm. now, but you used to have to to get in the best pegs. Um, and it is a proper. Sw- it is a, I was always kind of in denial that it was a swimmy lake, and I could. I thought that you know I could just go wherever. But I think mm-hmm. as the years went on, when you go back to the car park, it would just constantly be like the guys in the tea party or in the south end or up in the boom. They'd they'd be catching like a couple of 20s every trip and I just sort of I suppose I just conformed a little bit to the Walthamstow way um which then led me down the right sort of path yeah can you remember um your first capture from there yep funny enough I can I was um it was on the two and the three Uh, I'd gone with a couple of friends and we were fishing the one because obviously we thought that you know that would be our best chance of a bite and i was sitting down the hill looking out over the one and i could just hear these fish like boshing out could boom and um we were we went and had a look and we could see the rings and we were just like well you know they're showing like probably we should put a rod on it right and we kind of were like we were basically scared to put the rod out because we thought it was too hard and um we just ended up putting one rod each in the in the three and uh, left our other rods in the one. And about 15 minutes later, <laughs> it ripped off and I had my first ever Walthamstow carp. It was like a little 16-pound linear, I think. Right. Oh, nice. Um, I bet that's one that you'll treasure. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. It was a bit of like a eureka moment as well. Like I'm sure everyone knows about that, where you kind of get that first one and then you're like, do you know what? They're only carp. Could, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, the confidence suddenly then because I was a bit like that when I um, went on Christchurch for the first time. I sort of joined, uh, did my first session in the winter, and obviously you, at that time you couldn't use maggots or zigs, and it was it was hard. Nothing was being caught. You could see the odd show, but again, there it was all ziggy stuff. Mm-hmm. And you couldn't use them, and it was sort of several sessions until the water warmed up. I actually caught, but then when you start catching, like you say that that confidence is there and you're it's game on isn't it then really yeah definitely like i I still get that now even though i've caught um some decent fish from around the way Mm. i still turn up at new lakes and if they're particularly hard waters i still feel that i still feel a little bit underconfident at at the beginning until you get the first one and the the lockwood was was definitely like that i mean i just Mm. it did feel like it was never going to come good and then once the first one came in it um it all turned around yeah and that's um a proper water isn't it yeah like it it is a mad place i think the first sort of time i ever heard anything about the lockwood was was actually way back in the day when i was about 18 and um Hmm. i was in the car park about (laughs) about 10 11 a.m typical sort of turning up time and i got chatting to this guy um I think it was Steve furniture Steve and basically he he was just telling me how we'd been fishing this this lake called the Lockwood and it was it was big and hard but no one else goes up there and he just said you know if, if you go up there and fish the same spot every single time eventually you'll catch one and uh he showed me a few photographs a few like mid 30s from what I can remember and like back back then 10 years ago like a mid 30 was just colossal you know to me I'd I'd probably only ever had one thirty, I think, at that point. So, a mid thirty, a big scaly, was like the type of fish I could think. Well, I'd I'd spend the next sort of five years of my life chasing. Um, and I spent the rest of that day on the two and three, and then at around six pm, when it was time to go home, um, just before bite time, I, I thought I'd have a look on the Lockwood, and I crossed the road and and went up there. So crossed the road onto the lower side, and there's like the Lockwood, for anyone who doesn't know it, is sort of um, elevated. I wouldn't know how many feet, maybe like 50 feet up in the air. I'm not too sure. Right. Um, it's pretty high. 
And I took, I walked up the stairs and I just took one look at it and I was like, no, nah, you know, this, this is not for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't really catch him out of the two and the three. Uh, I can't even catch him out of the one. This is just ridiculous. It's just uh, like 90 acres of barren, <laughs> barrenness. And uh, we, we kind of have a joke between me and my friends and we always say that the Lockwood is essentially just everything amplified. So if it's windy, it's it's like it's hurricane up there. It's hurricane right. force. Um, if it's warm, it's like you know another a foreign country hot up there. And if it's cold, likewise. Like it's the only lake I would never ever go. Um, I mean, even if it was a thirty degree summer day, I'd still pack my snug pack because you honestly, when the wind turns up there, there's, there's literally um, when you when you crest the hill, you've got a path that goes round all the way round, which is like. Um, uh, not concrete path, but I'm not really sure what what kind of path is for driving. Mm-hmm. And then you've got about a three foot drop down onto the concrete slopes, and then just water, and that's all the way around. You've got a pumping station at each end, right. so there's there's no trees, there's no cover, and yeah, it is. It, it's a bit of a different water to anywhere else I've ever fished because it's not like any other lake in respect that it doesn't have any trees around it. <laughs> mm, yeah. So I'd imagine it was absolutely so. It's, and even it's hard to describe. But I know what you mean. It's just I suppose it being elevated. It just like being on a hilltop, isn't it? it? Just whips over it. Yeah, definitely. And also, I think if you're um, on ground level, there's obviously there's trees and other things in the mm, distance breaking really the wind. Yeah. But because it's yeah. so high up, the wind is just going over the top of all the like. As you look back towards the two and the three or the lower, you're higher than all the other trees. So. Mm. It's yeah, it's savage. And when I was like eighteen, I just took one look at it and I was like, right, nah, you know that. <laughs> no, there's just no chance. Um, and I think, if I remember right, I rang my friend Mags on the way home, and and I, you know, I just said about the discussion I'd had, mm. and he told me he told me to read Martin Clark's book. There was a big section about like the unknown Lockwood monster, and to be honest, that all that did was just deter me even further because I just realised how hard it was. Um, and I, I, I put it in the um, in the cart fishing vault as to at some point in my life I'd go back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So where did um, your fishing take you after that period? Well, after like so, well, yeah. It's obviously sort of putting that on the back burner. Did you carry on on um, stow or? Yeah, I plugged away on. Um, on the stow and I always fish like my local park lakes. I've got like real, I'm really passionate about like the local lakes with, you know, like those really pretty 20 pounders, like really old yeah. scalies. So like South Weald, Bellas country park, Canal forest park, uh, fell up waters. So I plugged around on these park lakes for ages. And, um, the problem was I wasn't ever on a syndicate. So I never got like in the syndicate click. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. To get recommended onto the next syndicate. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really struggled to get on anywhere other than like fr- either free fishing lakes or club waters. Um, and then I got lucky and managed to get a ticket on a local lake called Luxborough, um, which mm. was like a, as another big, big pit, big deep pit. And um, I done really well on there. And that kind of, I kind of met a few people on there. And then I started to fish some of the, the more known Essex waters. And then that kind of brings you into what 2017 is is when the fish kill happened and that was when i really yeah. turned my attention to the stone and just thought i have to give it a few years now yeah yeah and so obviously with with you fishing sort of mostly those park lakes does did that sort of shape your style of angling obviously if you weren't on the syndicate regularly you know getting spots going sort of being in tune with it did you sort of find just what was your style was it sort of you know little spots um a little bit of bait bags yeah I, I think it definitely shaped me um a lot of the fishing i done on those park lakes was like like baiting up because they're yeah. often t- the lakes that time forgot you know there's no one else there because they're not packed full of 30s and 40s there might be like one or two 30s in them and yeah. um you just get the opportunity to like bait up and get back obviously some lakes you can fish at night some you can't so i spent like all my sort of all those years just doing loads of overnighters i didn't do a lot of day fishing at all it'd usually be like crashing in for an overnighter chance like a lot of the parks you can't fish at night but we would because they're just so treacherous in the day with the dog walkers and like you know people throwing 
um, things in for their dogs in the water, the geese, people feeding oh, yeah. the birds, picnickers in your swim, all kinds of all kinds of carnage. So just loads of overnighters. Um, and I think that, I suppose that definitely shaped me. Um, it's made me now really appreciate that, those kind of old strain of fish. And I still, even now, like, I still I'm absolutely buzzing if I catch a thirty. I'm not really mm. like a big fish. Um, man i don't i don't have to have a 40 or or even bigger or or even 10 40s in a lake for me to fish it you know i just like those yeah. really old strain of carp yeah nice um how often were you getting out at that time do this were you sort of several times a week or is it just as and when yeah and no, i'd say that like back then it was a bit more as and when i, I did take my mm. fishing seriously but obviously like i was in early early 20s so i'd be going away with my friends on holiday I'd going out drinking on the weekend and all those kind of things so i was hmm. not getting out for more than once a week um just like one overnight or a week or or one session i mean don't get me wrong sometimes when you, when you've got something special going on you might push the boat out but hmm. it was really probably in about i don't know 2015 16 when i started fishing luxborough the big pit that i started fishing properly and actually dedicating more time to it Right. Did you say that was quite a deep place? Yeah. So Luxborough um, is just a bizarre place. It's a, this huge pit near my house set in the middle of Chigwell. Um, right. And it's owned by some, some people bought it to try and backfill because it's about 80 foot deep in the middle. <laughs> um, and it's just basically been closed for fishing for, for years. And one of my friends, he went to school with the guy whose dad bought it. Right, and we just ended up getting a pass. We we um, we all clubbed together, ten of us, and um, we gave like three hundred pounds each, so that he got three grand, and he basically gave us a set of keys after that. Right, and um, so that was pretty weird. It was like our own little syndicate, <laughs> ten mates um, on this huge lake, and we didn't really know what was in there. Um, oh, wow. And yeah, it was it was really bizarre. It was like the type of situation that will probably never be repeated. And yeah. in the end, it turned out to be. Um, really good i think it was like we had a like a google folder where every time we caught one we'd put it in there and in about two and a bit years that we fished it we caught 33 different fish and i think it was about 15 over 30 two over 40 yeah. Oh, wow. and yeah they were just like they were just crazy carp because you never really knew what you were going to get and um <laughs> although i never saw any monsters in the edge we didn't catch i saw quite a few smaller fish um that we never caught um, so that was a really interesting place. And that was like what yeah. I remember reading um, Oz Holness's book when I was fishing there. And I think that was kind of like the pivotal point where I just started really taking my fishing seriously and, and dedicating all my spare time to it. Yeah. How, so how, obviously with the depth of that water, I mean, did it sort of shelve off like that gradually or did was it just like a sheer drop? What sort of, what was it, the makeup of the place? Um one side one it was about 35 acres and like one whole bank was pretty much unfishable because it would just be like 40 foot straight away um i just did clear of that side and then the rest of the lake there was um there was like a two big bays and they were about 10 foot all over so they were really nice to fish uh and then it would kind of it was typical it would go down to 10 foot and then it would go out for about 30 yards or te- no, probably 20 yards, and then down to 20, mm. 25 foot, and then it would go down like that. And there was a big road coming in from one corner where um, the trucks used to bring the gravel up. Um, right. And interestingly, there was a crane in the lake <laughs> just left <laughs> at the bottom of the, the gravel pit. But uh, I um, when I first started fishing there, everyone used to fish like right in the edge because everyone was scared of the depths. And one day, I just these a few fish showed, and I didn't even know how deep it was. I just sort of belted a couple of rods out there. Got a couple of takes um, instantly. And when I plumbed the depth after, I was fishing in just under 30 foot. And it was <laughs> like one of those eureka moments again where everyone was kind of like, oh, my God, you know, you can catch these fish from those depths. We don't have to be scared. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, with that then, obviously, when you realised how deep you were fishing, <clears throat> with obviously regards to like the swing back, I mean, did you have to sort of – did you factor anything in for that? Because obviously in that depth, surely that must sort of be noticeable. Yeah, I, I, um, it's a good it's a good point. I can't say that I ever even thought of that. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. I, I'm not. I, don't, I never really fish with wrap sticks or 
right. that much accuracy. So I think at the time I was just casting out, um, feeling for a drop, and then I just wait for my PVA nugget to pop up before I put the bait on. Mm-hmm. Sorry, before I pull the bait out. Yeah, yeah, that works, doesn't it? Keeping it simple. Yeah, definitely. I, I think you make a good point, though. I'm not really sure what um, what I would have done. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it's like anything, don't it? You can overthink it and it can frazzle you to the point where you just take no action because <laughs> there's so many different ways you can look at it, I suppose. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there probably so how long did you say on there? Was it two and a half years? Yeah, about about two and a half years, two, two years. Um, and like it was, it was hard. I had 10 fish the first year and 11 right. fish the second year. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, like it was, it was amazing. I think I, I caught my first 40 out of there. And had right. like loads of good fish, loads of old mirrors. Um, it was exciting as well. Like there was there was loads of good trees where you could get up and watch them feeding. I had a couple of takes where like you know I literally saw the fish clouding up, and then all of a sudden the rods away, mm. sort of thing. Mm. Gin yeah. clear water, and you know we uh, it was um it was almost like a throwback to some of the literature you read about like the early days when these guys were fishing like Raysbury and that because we were like gated in and there was only 10 of us and we were all friends. We just, mm. every night was just like a huge party. Like someone would bring a barbecue <laughs> and, um, and like thinking back, I mean, sometimes people used to be like pretty far off their rods. There was some suspect um, decision-making going on there, but everyone would like congregate and people were all right. You know, there was just 10 of us. We we're all friends. Uh, one year one guy just sort of said to everyone like i'm going to bait up this spot um and that was it we just left him to it yeah how did he get on from doing that yeah he done really well he baited it up um for i think a few weeks and nothing happened and then all of a sudden it, it kicked off and he was yeah. just um it was just hauling he he had like, <laughs> loads of the big ones and it was quite funny because one of the um Last things I did at over Luxborough was I caught um, – there was three big mirrors in there and I caught the, the third biggest mirror um, and I went home that day and my mum had been bugging me to cut the hedge outside. So I cut mm-hmm. the hedge and like long story short, I fell off the ladder with the hedge cutter and I managed to chop – like pr- pretty much chop about, I don't know, half an inch off the end of one of my fingers. <laughs> it was just hanging on and um i had to go and i had to go to hospital and have plastic surgery and like they sewed it all back on and it's all right now it's a bit deformed but um he was calling me up and um making me come and do his photos even though like i was um i couldn't drive i was getting a cab to the lake because <laughs> he wanted me to do his shots but i can remember like, i had the operation and he had a couple he had like 330s and he called me up to come down and I remember just sort of taking these photos. I was so nauseous, I think, from the um, the drugs and stuff as I just got out of hospital. I, I remember just saying, like, I'll take these photos, but I've got to go straight back home. <laughs> Christ. Is um, your finger all right now? It's okay. Um, luckily, the nail grew back, but there's a, a bit of it that never really lasts. It never, like, I don't know how to explain it. Maybe you can put a photograph up. There's a bit of it missing. Yeah. It's not the worst. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> crikey so where um where does that bring us in terms of your angling when you sort of came to an end on Luxborough yeah so I um I came to an end on Luxborough in the spring I caught this fish the pretty one um and I chopped my finger off I couldn't go to work and I was like I need to uh, I need something to do here I didn't really like what I was doing so that was when I started um training to be a teacher mm-hmm. and that again like my sort of love for carp fishing had grown massively and all of a sudden as a student like you've got tons of time on your hands so uh, I think after about three months or so I could go fishing and I was fishing um, this syndicate in Essex called Church Lake whilst fishing the stow on and off Um, and I think that does bring us to around 2017 when the fish kill happened like it was devastating yeah so um did you then, when, what I'm sort of gearing up to is when, when did you finally decide to give Lockwood a good bash? Um, in the spring of 2018, so post fish kill, that was when mm. I just, I didn't buy any tickets for any lakes apart from Walthamstow. I bought um, a complex ticket mm-hmm. and the complex ticket runs from March till the following March. But the two and three, which is like the two and three is the water I wanted to fish because I've always tried to catch the big common in the two and three. 
Um, but it doesn't open till June the 1st or thereabouts. And I kind of had that spring free. Um, and I was just looking for different waters to fish. And I was like, well, maybe I can fish the Lockwood. A couple of my friends had fished it beforehand. And they'd had uh, one of them had had the big mirror. It used to be a lot smaller. It was like a low 30 then. And I was just like, do you know what? I'm just gonna I'm gonna give the Lockwood a go. It's, I felt like it was the kind of ultimate test. Um, I'd fished Luxborough, which was another big pit, low stocked, and like you know when you get to that point where you just feel ready. Mm, yeah, yeah, awesome. And so, how did you hatch a plan to fish it? Because obviously, from your last, you know, had you been keeping sort of kept keeping the loop with people that you you knew on there, or how did that come about? Um, yeah, I. One of my friends fished it, and I can't lie, every photo I ever saw of a Lockwood fish had a tower in the background. Mm. Um, there's a tower at either end, the North and the South Tower. So that was kind of the only thing I had to go on. And interestingly, I didn't actually know the, the big common was even in there. I'd just seen a photo with Andy Maker holding the patch common, and mm. my friend had caught this this 30 mirror. And they were like more than enough to go for, you know, they were like like a pair of crackers. And mm. I remember ringing my friend up and saying, oh, yeah, there's that big common in there. And we were, we were talking about this fish, but we were actually talking about different fish. And it was only at the point when I said something about the patch, he said, no, you know what, there, there's a bigger one in there. Um, but obviously the Lockwood was affected by the fish kill as well. So there was a little bit of uncertainty about what was left. And I think post fish kill, only the patch had been out. So nothing else was certain. Right. Um, and we're in March, you know, like the Lockwood, it's pretty barren up there. It's, it feels like you're in January, to be fair. Yeah. And I think I just, um, I, I was keen. Like, I wanted to get up there and everyone was saying that it's way too early, it's way too early. But I waited till April um, and I started like really giving it a hit in April. Um, shall I just Shall I just take it away from there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so um the the first the first season I did on there, yeah, I feel like I have to sort of mention it even though nothing happened as such because if I didn't mention the first season and, and the grueling like the pure pain that I had, it would kind of <laughs> deduct from the whole thing. So yeah. hopefully it doesn't bore anyone. <laughs> no, carry um, on, mate. Carry but on. you know, like I feel sometimes I feel like in carp fishing everyone only ever highlights the the positives, but there, that first season was was a killer, man. I, I fished at April. Uh, the first ever night I did on there, I, I sort of fished down the far end, down the um, north end. And lo and behold, I, I actually saw a free carp show in April. And I can honestly say that, uh, I, yeah, I've never seen free carp show in there ever since. So on my first ever night, I kind of thought, you know what, I think I might have a chance here. Um, April... April passed by pretty uneventfully, as as did that night, of course. And all that really happened was I met another guy who was fishing up there called Kush, and he'd caught the big mirror in the previous April. And he was just saying, you know, it is worth giving it a go because he caught that fish in – he literally stalked it in the margins in a hailstorm, which kind of goes <laughs> against everything you'd ever expect. <laughs> Um, so April was, was kind of uneventful and I was starting to realize like, car, I've, I've taken on a big challenge here, but I had a bit of a safety blanket because I was thinking it doesn't matter when I get to June the 1st and the two and three opens, I'm, I'm just going to be on the two and three anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, and then May, May was actually a really interesting month and I definitely came close. Um, and the lake. I'm thinking, yeah, the lake hadn't done any fish in April. So that in 2018, we had two bank holidays in May. Um, I got up there on the first bank holiday to do, was it a 48? Yeah, so the first bank holiday was a 48 hours. So for anyone that doesn't know, uh, the stow is like, it's days only. But on the first and the third Saturday of every month, you're able to fish it at night. And rarely, occasionally on bank holidays, they do a 48 hour. So... I got up there and it was literally boiling hot um, that bank holiday and they just started letting the public um, have access to the site and it was being promoted all over Facebook and there was literally just zillions of people. Um, it was, it, I, I walked around and long story short, it was in the evening, I saw a fish, it looked quite a good fish, um, 
down at the first tower and I kind of had like a bit of a dilemma because it was like, do I fish on this, like where I've seen it, but this is where the public come up the stairs and it's literally like where just hundreds of people are coming up all day long and then they have mm. a look at the lake and maybe take a photo of the tower in the background and then go back. But I was like, yeah, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to give this a shout. Um, so I bivvied up in and amongst like all these picnickers and <laughs> it, was, yeah, it was, it was, you know, like, proper torturous every single person yeah. that come past like, oh are there fish in here yeah yeah there's fish yeah. and then oh are they big and are they what fish are they yeah. you know and you just have can to entertain them yeah can, can yeah. you eat them yeah of course yeah. and then you know you've got people jumping down on the um on the slope throwing stones and I've, i think i've learned over the years through fishing in the parks you just have to like blanket out because if you yeah. you know if you get wound up by it it ends up like severely ruining your trip <laughs> um but yeah this this fish was was definitely knocking around it was like a huge pipe that goes into the water to suck um water out of the lockwood in an emergency and um this fish was definitely hanging around there and although i didn't catch that fish in the morning i had a really i've got a really cool story to share where there's like this small tower and um it was really early like 7 a.m 6 7 a.m i'd climbed up the tower um took my cup of tea up there in my porridge pot and I was like just watching the water, looking around the pipe, trying to see if this carp was still about. Um, and I saw this little fish just cruising the, the marginal shelf and I was like thinking, that, God, that must be the smallest carp I've ever seen. Um, and long story short, it turned sideways and I saw the like stripes and it turned out it wasn't a carp, it was a perch. <laughs> um, I just spent the whole winter perch fishing so yeah. I was, I was, so I started to watch this perch, and it's really rare to see perch in the water because obviously, like they're predators and they're always camoed in. And I, I, mm. I don't really know what it was up to. It, it seemed a bit lost, to be fair. And it came right up the marginal shelf into about four or five foot of water, gin clear, and um, it was just hanging around. And I started to think to myself, like, oh, that's a big perch, you know, that's the big one of the biggest perch I've ever seen, and I, I need to catch it. So I, I rifled from my bag looking for like maybe I'd have a um, not a spinner, but a jig or, or something just from the winter. Yeah. But yeah. in truth, like typical style, I'd had one of those big clear outs a couple of weeks before where, you know, when you take everything out because you're, you're scaling down because you want to yeah. be as lightweight as possible. Um, yeah. I didn't, I didn't have anything. So, do you know, I, I don't know why I did it, but I thought I'd just make a jig, which consisted of stuff that was in my cart fishing box. So it was like 10 pound zig line, tied on loop to loop to my 20 pound X line. Um, about six foot of that, size four choddy, uh, two or three BB shots. And then I was like, right, I need something, you know, as to use as a lure. So I got the tin foil off my Quaker's porridge pot and I basically <laughs> scrunched it up and hooked it on. <laughs> so I am, um, I've, and that, bear in mind, this is on like a, a high S, right? With 20 pound X line. This, it's <laughs> extremely hard to cast something out that weighs about two grams. Um, and it took me ages to get it out near this fish. But as soon as I landed it near it, it took an interest. And um, yeah. after about 15 minutes worth of cat and mouse of this perch following this homemade lorem, um, eventually I got it to take it. And um, I can remember it just, it smashed it and I struck and like, to my surprise, the rod hooped over. And then oh, I just had the weirdest thing, like big pit reel, big old high S. I'm playing like <laughs> this perch in. And um, I netted it. And I'll never forget this guy. He would just come over the hill, an angler from the lower. And he was like, oh, mate, mate, have you got one? And I said, yeah, I've got one. I, he went, what is it? I went, oh, it's a proper old dark gnarly one. <laughs> and uh, he was like, he shouted down to his friends on the lower. He's like, this geezer up here has got one, boys, get up here. So they've all come storming up the hill and they're all thinking they're going to see some like mythical 40 pounder or something. And <laughs> I lifted it out of the water and it was like this perch. And they're and like typical <laughs> carp anglers, like they just didn't yeah. care. They were so unimpressed. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, in fact, uh, we wait. I remember I, I poured all my boilies out on the path from my air dry sack and I weighed it in the air dry sack. And it was like, yeah. it was three pound 10 sp spawned <laughs> out, you know, it was, yeah. if it had had spawn, if I'd caught it when I was perch fishing a month before, it would have been the biggest yeah. perch ever for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
so yeah, that was that was a really cool story, and it and that one kind of like spread like wildfire because I remember uh, a couple of weeks later, some guy coming up to me and just saying like, "Did you hear about that guy catching a perch on on a bit of tin foil?" <laughs> <laughs> um, right. But yeah, May May just May was just a, an absolute slap. I did the nights, um, and I remember just thinking like, "Cool, this place is hard." One weekend, I went there. Um, I was working full time actually in May, and I did Saturday and Sunday. It was a night, and when I checked my my um, health app on my phone, it was like mm. I think I'd done eighteen miles, eighteen and a half miles worth of walking that weekend. <laughs> like, and and I'd seen nothing, and I just started to think mm. like I, I really don't know what I've signed myself up for here. Um, there was another bank holiday in May, and I couldn't get to the lake. I couldn't. Uh, was there, there wasn't a night. There was just um, the obviously the opportunity to fish the Monday as well, and I couldn't get there. Um, one of my friends he went up there on Saturday, and he he wasn't fishing the Lockwood. He was just like wanted to check out. I'd been up there and I'd sending him videos and stuff, and he just wanted to check it out. And bearing in mind, I've probably done in two months. I've done I don't know twenty five trips, twenty twenty trips. Yeah. I've seen three carp show and one carp swimming around the pipe in like twenty days. Um, it's pretty hard to find them, and lo and behold, he managed to find about ten fish. Like, or, or I don't know, maybe I don't actually. I'm not sure if there's even ten in there, but he he found the whole stock right down in the bottom mm-hmm. corner, and um, he he did the day on them, didn't catch, and he didn't even tell me. <laughs> um, and I just remember the next day, I woke up to a text. Uh, this was a Sunday. I woke up to a text about one o'clock from Kush, so one of the guys who was up there, and it just mm. basically said, like, oh, "Hey, Lewis, um, I met one of your friends up here yesterday. He was on the fish. Um, I came back in the morning. I, I had found them as well. And then the next thing was just this picture of a massive common, like forty-six pound common, mm. or a forty-four pound common. Sorry, forty-three, forty-four back then. And I was like, whoa, like you know, that was that just shows how." Um, how fine a line it is. And I was due to go down the next day, which I did. Um, again, like nothing, just standard Lockwood. You're just looking at water all day long, impossible to find, and you're just questioning your sanity, basically. Um, and, I mean, I, I did learn a lot of interesting things when I was fishing the Lockwood that spring because I realized that one of the, the main things I realized was about like the angle of the sun. So when you're fishing like the – the lakes like Lockwood where it's just a big, vast, flat area, I mean the water, mm. in terms of like it's not little bays and stuff, the angle of the sun plays a massive part in like what you can see. Right, okay. Which it was, it's just amplified as to normal. And you use, like one thing I used to have to do is you'd kind of like, whenever you would see fish, they would already have seen you. So right. in the end, I end up used to, I'd walk like 100 yards up the bank and then I'd walk back so that the sun was behind me. Do you know what I mean? So I had a chance to see them before they saw me. Right, got you. Um, yeah. I learned loads of cool stuff, but long and the short of it was uh, that spring was just a grawler, and it only did two fish in May. That, that guy Kush had them both. He had a 20 common and a 40 common. And um, on the 1st of June, the two and the three season started. Um. And I, I caught a 20 pounder on my first trip and I went back. Yeah. I had like four days to fish and I caught about, I don't know, 10 fish, I think up to 33. <laughs> and it was kind of at that moment, every, it was just a battle. Like I wanted to carry on on the Lockwood, but the big one had already been out and the two and three, like I was doing well at this point, I'd kind of clocked what I needed to do on there. And really, I think the rest of 2018 was just like a battle in my own head about, you know, like oh, I should get back up there, but it's it's so granite and um the two and three was was like i was doing really well um i did go back up there one day in the summer one day i turned up and my friend mick who was a bailiff he'd been up there earlier in the day and he said that all the fish were along the natural bank and it, it was actually a bit of a key finding thinking back because um down the natural bank there's like a load of boys and I always measured everything like first boy, second boy, third boy. And I noticed that day when I went up there that the fish, w- there was something happening between the first and the second boy. I don't know what it was, but the fish were just like, they wanted to be there. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
I went back the next day and I fished a little bit that week actually on them fish. It was really weedy and it was really, really hard to, the fish were so high up the shelf, like they were up in like three foot of water. So the, where the path is, it, it then dips down to the lake and you can't put your bank sticks in on the path. So to go to the grassy bits, put your bank sticks in, like you run that risk of getting seen by the fish. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it, it was difficult because I was literally having to cast the rods out from from far back, one cast per rod, and half the time they were just landing in the weed. But I knew that you know, like if if they if they see you, they just you literally can watch them swim from in front of you to about 150 yards out. <laughs> um, and also like the other chap that had been fishing up there, he had he'd, he'd noticed this, and he was literally putting his rods out, and he was bivying up about 50 yards down the bank, just so mm-hmm. that you know, like we you, the silhouette is massively amplified there because there's no trees in the background. I mean, if you were a fish looking up, there's nothing mm-hmm. to see. So as soon as you see something. Yeah. Something's up. Yeah. It's abnormal. Right. And they know. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah so 2018 Lockwood campaign consisted of like two months of like really, really trying my hardest. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, I think I wasn't fishing. I was fishing hard, but I don't think I was fishing smart. Because I, right. I was of the opinion that if I just walked enough, one day I'd see a fish feeding in the edge, lower a rig in, and I'd get a quick take. Hmm. Which, you know, could have happened, but it, it just didn't happen for me, basically. Right. Um, and then that kind of pushes us, like, round to the, you know, like, I fished the two and three up till sort of late November. And then in two, like in 2018... Yeah, around Christmas time was like super busy with uni work and um, school. I was still training to be a teacher then. And really like that got me all the way around to about March of last year, not this year. Yeah. Um. So yeah, what's up? Yes, yeah, April now, isn't it? Kind of a yeah. little bit earlier than we are now. Um. And I was thinking of the Lockwood, but I was really conscious of the fact that it's, n- it's really hard to fish up there for extended periods. So I, I thought to myself, I'm not going to go back till May the 1st unless we get like an extremely hot period. And, um, you know, that, that's a bit of a game changer. I'm not, I'm not going to bother going back. And I thought mm-hmm. I'd just fish, you know, some other places in the spring. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Don, one sec, I've just got to have a drink. No worries, mate. It's fine. <sighs> Yep. So, like, fast forward to spring of last year. Um, nice. By the time I got to the Lockwood on the 1st of May, well, I did actually hold out till the 1st of May, um, I was rocking. <laughs> I'd, uh, <laughs> I I went back. It, the first trip I did back was mid-February on the 2 and 3, and I had the biggest mirror. Um, first trip back, day session. That was pretty good. That was, like, uh, just under 37 Right. Um, it's like the it, the big mirror died in the fish kill, so that one's now the big mirror. And um, yeah. I had a, I managed to have a few before the two and the three season finished. Um, also that year, some of the local guys had realised that actually you could book out the two and three during the close season. Like that's what the BCAC have done for years. Mm-hmm. Um, and they booked it out. I think we did three nights in the close season. Um, like you know, like twenty of us, we do a draw. And it was carnage, obviously, because it was a closed season. And I had about, I think it was about 13 or 14 fish in those three nights and up to like <laughs> mid-30 again. Yeah. And I fished another lake, um, waterside fisheries, round in like Chesham Way. And I was like, you know, like when you're just in an absolute purple patch, you can't put a foot wrong. Yeah, yeah. Literally, um, I was just root catching consistently like every trip. I fished another lake. Um, uh, by the way, like I was giving it, I was fishing loads at this point. You know, like if anyone's thinking, how was he doing all this? I was, I was a student and I was fishing loads. Um, one of the lake was like a, a no fishing lake. It's a fair way away from my house. There's no fishing at all. And I, I know there's a big common in there. So I was fishing there, turning up like after dark, um, and um, just doing the nights, leaving it early in the morning. At first light, the bin men used to come and change the park bins. And they, they mm-hmm. gave me aggro the first time they saw me there. Like, you know, you're not allowed to fish here. We're going to call the police. So I was doing nights on there. And as it, as it sometimes happens, everything just fell into place. Because right at the end of April, I caught that, the fish out of that lake. 
um, on an overnighter, like a swervy. And I was kind of tied up all my loose ends. The two and three was closed. It kind of got round to the 1st of May and I was thinking like, it's time for the Lockwood again. Hmm. Um, also, another thing to note was that at this point, I was sort of so one track minded in terms of like, I was going to catch that Lockwood Common because, like, sorry, to probably to rewind just a tiny bit um to about february march time i'd got the job officially got the job as the summer ranger at the stow so mm. i knew like you know i was going to be able to spend time in the days looking around the lakes as i'd be on the complex like five days a week um mm. one thing though i didn't know early on around christmas time was if i was going to get the job or not and i'd literally geared up to fish the lake i bought um I bought four R- RX pluses because my old Dell Kims, like they were, they were from like when I was about 16, 17, I bought them and they just didn't have the range. And like the, the way of the Lockwood, the way everyone kind of fishes it is you spread your rods out because it's all much of a muchness. There's not really any point in fishing like this, like a 20 yard patch in front of you. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd, gone out i bought four rx's and a receiver i even bought a power barrow <laughs> that's that's how much i was going for it <laughs> um season started start of may it's quite ironic actually because the, the power barrow hardly ever got any use because i got the obviously i i where once i was a bailiff the bailiffs gave me lifts everywhere in the truck <laughs> um but yeah going from may onwards um i just need to get my bearings Mm-hmm. Um, yeah so may i was work i was actually i was working full time in school again thinking about mm-hmm. it and um it may was pretty crap i saw um i was just able to fish both the nights of the month and one day on each weekend so i only did four trips in may um i saw two fish cruising one day, which like when you see fish cruising on the Lockwood, it's proper buzzing because you're like, oh my yeah, God, yeah. I'm on them. You're like, if they're in the edge, yeah. you know, here, they're not mm. in the other 89 acres sort of thing. So yeah, yeah. you feel like you've got somewhat <laughs> chance, somewhat of a chance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but May, like, there's probably not much point in me going on about May because it was pretty, pretty rubbish, really. Um, and come around to like the first of June, June was, was the month I'd been gearing up for. So at this point I was like rocking, I had everything ready to go. And, um, the first, it was the first of June. It was the first, um, night on the two and three. So I was working the Saturday at, at Walthamstow. I was working Saturday morning and the Sunday afternoon. So as was quite often the way, instead of like finishing my shift and going home and coming back the next day, I would mm-hmm. like, um, finish my shift and then go fishing, fish the day and the night. And then, you know, like I'd be back at work the next day. We had a shower and stuff there. So it was just, it was like a waste of petrol to go home really. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and obviously just a sacrilege. Why would you go home when, you know, you can go fishing, um, mm-hmm. you know, the ranger at the end of the day. So it was the first night of the year for everyone on the complex. And I remember thinking, I'm going to do the draw. I'm going to get all the anglers sorted and then I'm going to get up the Lockwood and basically spend as much of my shift as I possibly can up there looking and, and nowhere to go. But things didn't go to plan. Like the first day of the season on the one, two, three in the West Warwick, it was inundated with people and like hundreds of people. You've got like the public coming in and then you've got people coming that they don't even have a net or an unhooking mat. Some people like they can't speak English. So you're trying to help them. But like for one guy, he sticks in my memory, he didn't have a net or an unhooking mat and he didn't speak a word of English. And it's really difficult to tell someone mm. you need that if they can't speak English. <laughs> uh, we ended up doing that through like a translation app but yeah long story short <laughs> my shift just flew by it was one o'clock i hadn't even been up there and um i was ready to go so i was fishing the night like with everyone else um i got up on the locky. it was it was real good weather it was blowing a strong southerly which blows down the far end um but there was already two guys already down there because obviously they turned up on the gate at 7 a.m and, and i was working that morning so um, I, I dropped my gear off. I got I got my land to drop me and my gear up there just to save my power bar- my battery on my power barrow because I was thinking I was, I was anticipating doing a lot of walking because I had from like sort of one thirty till seven eight pm to get my rods out. Right. Um, 
And I thought to myself, do you know what? There's probably no point in walking the way the wind's going because you've got a guy on the end of the wind and I've got a guy opposite me, albeit he's like 400 yards over, four or 500 yards. He's, he's there. Like, this is the only spot I can fish down this end. But if I walk the other way, there's no one. You know, there was only two people on that night. Um, and it was bizarre, really, because I was just walking along. Uh, I was chatting to my phone, uh, chatting to my phone, chatting to my brother on the phone. And I was leaning up against a life boy for for the reason I pointed out earlier that like I always stopped near the life boys because I thought that then if the fish looked up, you know, they wouldn't see your silhouette. They must be used to mm-hmm. the life boy being there. And I remember I was so far away from my gear. Like my gear was just a dot. I think the Lockwood's probably about a mile long and I must have been about three quarters of a mile away. I could just about see my gear. And obviously, even though you know it's, it's, it's not safe because you're in the middle of Walthamstow, but mm-hmm. even though you know like there's not going to be anyone down there because the public couldn't walk down to that pit. You, you're always a bit para, right? Because your gear's worth so yeah, much money. Yeah. And um, yeah. and I was saying to my brother, like, I think I'm going to go back because I can't even see my stuff. If someone runs up the hill, they could, they could have my rod bag and go back down the hill and over the fence. I wouldn't even notice. And um, I, I took about, like, I don't know, like 20 or 30 more steps in, in the opposite direction from my gear. And uh, lo and behold there was just a fish just right in the edge. Um, like a really decent fish sitting in the edge on the, the first about three meters of the Lockwood are, um, like gravel. And I worked out that it's gravel on top of concrete stones. And I think that those, right. the big concrete slabs that form the reservoir really hold the heat. Right. So the okay. fish like to get like right up in the shallow water. Cause I, I mean, obviously shallow water is warm anyway, but I'm sure that the, the stones must hold heat. Yeah, like a storage heater, I suppose, like the old electric storage heater, that sort of thing. Yeah. So they get charged up almost by the sun and then sort of release a bit of heat over time. Exactly. And it, yeah. it was like a, a reoccurring theme. I mean, it wasn't that much of a reoccurring theme because seeing fish on there just didn't happen that much. Like if you think I've yeah. done like, I don't know, 40-odd trips by now, I'd, I'd seen three fish show – and a few cruising and that was it like the rest of the time you were just fishing blind or or Mm -hmm. or bottling it and going on the lower (laughs) um (laughs) but yeah i saw this fish in the edge and it was like it looked a good fish and i remember there was a swan right there and for a second i was are my eyes playing tricks on me you know there's a shadow of the swan the swan was coming towards me probably thinking he was going to get some bread or something and the fish Mm. moved diagonally under the swan and, and i was like you know like you know what it's like as soon as you see one in them situations yeah. you're doubting yourself because you've just spent the last probably 30 odd hours looking at that water and you haven't seen anything um yeah. and then all of a sudden he's popped back out from behind the swan and i'm like god that's a good fish now that's and it's a common and i said yeah. to my brother where well, i was on the phone it, it was kind of i got caught out i shouldn't have been there on the phone and i was like oh, i've just seen one it was a it was a big fish uh, it was a common oh, it, might, it, it can only be the patch or the big common um mm. and like for the re- i haven't really said what's in there um post fish kill i i've i've got records of everything caught and there's only seven carp in there that like, i'm not saying there's only seven carp but there's only seven carp that have been caught and that i've got photographs of um right. and there's two commons that are that kind of weight you know, the patch and the big common. Um, and then there's the big mirror. There's another 30 mirror and a couple of twenties and a past and like mm-hmm. a, a small fish. Um, and I was like, Oh, I've seen one, you know, like that's just, that's the break you need with a night in front of you as well. I'm thinking, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I literally jogged back to my gear, which is, was, it was far. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was properly blowing. I got back to my gear and I hadn't, it wasn't even on the barrow actually. I remember I'd just thrown it all on the floor. So I've lo- I, my barrow was still in pieces, right? I've, lo- I've put the barrow together, you know what it's like. And I'm literally thinking, oh, if someone comes up the hill, they're going to see it. There was never any chance that anyone was going to come up the hill and see it. Hmm. Um, and I've, I've just got all my gear down there and uh, it, it wasn't in the edge. Uh, I, I did. Um, I walked further right round to the first tower just to see, like, oh, is there maybe three or four somewhere else? Is this really the best place to set up? Um, but there wasn't. And long, I, yeah, I flicked out um, four singles. It was about three in the afternoon, and I thought, I just want to get one rod. In, like, I want to get a rod in now. See if I can get a quick bite. I had them quite high up the shelf in about six foot of water, um, yeah, yeah. and I flicked out the rods. And after about 
I don't know, an hour, I was knackered and I thought to myself, do you know what, I'm going to have a quick nap because um, I'd, I'd obviously been work. I was working full time in a school, and then that Saturday I, I had to work at Walthamstow as well. So I was starting my job. Um, I was proper shattered. I had a I had a nap, and when I woke up, I remember just thinking it was a um, Tottenham. Who did Tottenham play in the Champions League final? Oh, Liverpool. Liverpool. Yeah, it was a Tottenham Liverpool game, and I remember thinking, right, I'm going to redo my rods. I'm going to get them out all pucker and. Um, I'll watch the Champions League final, have some dinner, and then I'll, yeah. I'll just go to bed. Uh, disaster struck. I'll never forget this. And I, I suppose I, I kind of owe this guy, Steve. I, I basically, I'd run out of foam nuggets. And mm. I was, you know, I was cursing, like, how can I have run out of foam nuggets? I've done so much fishing. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be forgetting things sort of thing. Yeah. And, and as I was, like, doing my, doing my, uh, my nuts, so to say, uh, this guy, I'd met him twice on the Lockwood and – uh, in all fairness, I'm not sure why he ever talked to me because the first time he met me, I had my fourth rod so far away from where I was fishing, like, and it, I he couldn't set up on the tower because of where my rod was, and like yeah. it was bang out of order. I had the rod like miles away, and you know if that was me, I probably wouldn't have ever spoke to him again. But he, he pulled up and he was like, "Hey, doing mate, blah blah blah," and I said, "Look, can I punt some foam nuggets off you?" Um, <laughs> I got some nuggets off him and he ended up setting about, he set up about 200, 300 yards up the bank. Right. And obviously like, it's a bit, it's not, it's not weird, but you know, you can see everything cause there's no trees. There, there's no swims. Mm-hmm. It's just a continual bank. You just set up where you want. Right. Yeah. So yeah, the rods went out and I, like, I was fishing four rods. I had um, two rods on not a lot of bait and two rods on about hundred baits on each rod. Mm-hmm. Um, watch the champions league final I'm a gooner, so sorry if to any Tottenham fans listening, but obviously I was delighted to go to bed knowing that uh, <laughs> Tottenham hadn't won the Champions League. <laughs> um, it was it was it was a good night. I, I went to bed. I was under the stars. Do you know what I mean? I had all my gear. Just it was just in a big old heap next to me, and yeah. um, it, it was quite an electric feel because you had the lean navigation right behind you, and there was people, pissed people, going up and down the path to the early hours, yeah. like singing football songs where they'd been out, they'd watched the Champions League final. And like, don't get me wrong, I wasn't confident. I wouldn't have betted money that I was going to catch. But in the grand yeah. schemes of the Lockwood, I was about as confident as you could be. Yeah. Um, and there's loads of like floating weed. So I turned my um, sensitivity on my alarms right down to the point where you had to pull about a foot's worth of line off to get like a right. single beep. And I remember I was just sleeping, like, as you do. It was about 3.30 in the morning, and I was like, I got a beep, just one beep. And I woke up, mm. and, you know, like, usually you, you, one beep's nothing, you know. You probably wouldn't even, like, bat an eyelid. But I just remember yeah. thinking to myself, God, that sensitivity is so low that for me to get one beep, I've something's moved about a foot. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Mm. Um, and I'm, I didn't get out of bed or anything. I just laid there, and I just thought, I just thought to myself, it's, it's a liner. You know, it's positive. Um, I think I was just falling back to sleep and I just, like, the alarm was like, beep. And then it was like, beep. And in hindsight, I suppose the rod was probably ripping off, but the sensitivity was so low that yeah. it was just going, beep, beep, <laughs> beep. And I was like, I- I'll never forget this because I-, I didn't even flinch. Like, you know, I was mm. so sure that it wasn't happening in my mind. I didn't even <laughs> like, you know what I mean? You know, if you yeah, get one yeah, beep... Yeah, it's surreal, isn't it? It's surreal. Like if you get one beep on a normal lake, like on a turn, if you get a beep on a turn of three, like you better start walking towards your rods because it's going to get ripped off anytime soon. And I, yeah. it was going beep beep, and I was just thinking, "Cool, that'll stop in a minute." And um, <laughs> it, it's just kept going. I'm, I'm thinking, "What's going on?" Uh, <laughs> I sort of I swung my feet off my bed and put my Crocs on. And I remember I'd, I'd one rod behind me and three rods down the other way. And that was where I'd seen the fish. And I was looking at them. I was thinking, none of the lights are on, you know. What's going on? And then, oh, yeah, I've got that rod up there. So I had a look left and the, the light was on. And it's a bit like, well, I better go check this out because something's happening. And I, honestly, at that point, as silly as it sounds, I, I didn't think I was I didn't think I was in. I, I just thought, I don't know. 
a big old like weed beds probably took me out or something. Who knows? Um, yeah. And I remember just getting to the, I walked to the rod. That was how sure I was. I walked about 40 <laughs> yards to the rod. <laughs> Cause uh, I'm li- I was literally fishing over about a hundred yards. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. And I walked about, fo- I walked to this rod. Well, I walked to about 10 foot of it where I could see it, it was just peeling. And I was like, yeah. no, Oh my God, I'm in. Um, and this, it was my fourth rod, like you're not really meant to use a fourth, but on the Lockwood, I think, you know, everyone does. And it was um, yeah. a 50 quid Nash rod, which I bought when I was 17, right? Um, <laughs> and just a really crap reel. And it was just melting. And I was like, the only decent thing on it was I'd put a um, 20 pound X line on it. Like I, I did, right. I did put a good line on it. You know, I wasn't going to go in with like whatever line was on it from back in the day. Yeah, yeah, and like yeah. it was melt, it was properly melting. You know, if it was on a Delkin, it would have been like howling, and you, I would have been out of the bed in seconds. <laughs> and I, like you know, I just bent into it as you normally do. And I can honestly say that I've ne- I've never actually had a leg shaking fight, but I remember my right leg was shaking. And it was just ripping off line, like proper angry, big carp, like big, deep pit carp, just pinging off line. Yeah. And I'm like, I was just shitting myself. Um, <laughs> it was it was a moment of like disbelief because I, we're like talking 40, 40, 50th trip over two calendar years. Like, don't get me wrong. It wasn't like when the boys do these hardcore campaigns every week of the year, you know what I mean? But it was a yeah. grueler. And I was like, yeah. I remember even thinking – yeah, no, nah, it's definitely not a bird because it's like it's proper taking line. And uh, <laughs> I was kind of doing everything in my willpower to convince yeah. myself it wasn't a fish. Um, and eventually I had to succumb to the idea that, you know, it was. And I got, you know, like the fight went on. It was a good scrap. Um, and I remember it boiled up quite close in and I could see it was a common. I could see it was a big mm-hmm. fish. And I started to think it's one of them. It's that common from the margin, you know, like it, this is – this is it. Maybe I've got the big common, which is ultimately like the fish, the, the one that I was, all, I was going for. Cause it was just so mm. nice. Um, and yeah, like I just jumped in the lake. I always jump in the lake to net my fish. I don't know why. Um, I jumped in, like, I had my Crocs on my shorts and I, I walked out and, um, you know, when people say like, Oh, the fish, the fish kissed the spreader block before I netted it. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I'm not one for that. I am the total opposite. Like, I literally lunge and like grab them. It's probably quite yeah. alarming for pe- other people to watch. And I remember though, <laughs> <laughs> like, literally sometimes when pe- I'm net- netting my brother's fish, he'll be like, "No, don't go for it yet." And I'm like, "No, no, I'll get it." And and I- I'll just proper swipe at it. Um, yeah. I'm not like one of these people that coolly plays them in. I'm like, "No, you're going in the net." That's why I jump in because I get so excited. Yeah. I'm like, I have to get it in. <laughs> Um, and I've drifted it over the net cord and I actually remember thinking I, I won't lift the cord up till it goes in and I remember his head hit that spreader block I lifted the cord up and it was just like oh yes like fuck, fucking hell I've got one like wow and I just was like I mean, like, even now, it's quite hard for me to tell you how I was feeling because yeah. I was you just... You forget what to do, don't you? You get what, <laughs> no. sorry? You forget what to do, don't you, at that moment? Yeah. On a hard water, it's like, ugh. It's just like, whoa, oh, my <laughs> God. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, it's, oh, it's a big fish. It's a big fish. <laughs> like, fucking hell. Oh, it's a common. And I, I, I was like, what common is it? And I rolled it on its side and I see the big patch. And I was like, ah, oh, it's the patch. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> fucking hell! And then they're not. I was like, right. I, I just got myself together. It took. It took me a long time. Um, <laughs> I was just standing in the lake, and I was just. It was. It was still dark, and um. And then I was like, wow, my um my retainer and my mat are like fifty yards down the bank. I never really thought this through. Like, what am I gonna do? <laughs> I, I can't actually remember what I did. I know what I did when I had the big common. I don't know if I just rested the net because there's no, it's not like a normal lake where you've got a flat surface and then it drops. It's just a gradual decline. Like mm-hmm. there's no little tree stumps to hook the net onto. Do you know what I mean? I, mm-hmm. I think I just put the net down. Like I left, I didn't cut the rig or anything and I just sprinted, grabbed my, um, grabbed the, the waistling and the net. No, sorry, I didn't I di- didn't weigh it um, because I 
it was too big to sort of do on my own in the night. Mm-hmm. I just thought, let me just get it in the retainer and then I can like relax. So I took the retainer down there and I managed to get it, fumble it into the retainer. I had two nets, um, like I had two nets because I was fishing so my rod's such at a distance, you couldn't just have one net. Mm-hmm. So I knew that like I didn't have to panic about, um, yeah, I mean, you're not going to get two in a night up there anyway, but um, I bundled it into the retainer and just like weighed it out to about sort of like belly button height, storm pole in, fish like attached, got out of the water and was like, right, you know what I mean? At that minute you can relax. Mm. Um, and I had a massive dilemma because I was kind of like, do I go and tell this guy, this this Steve guy, who actually I'm really good friends with now, really nice guy, um, do I tell him or do I do what do I do? Do I ring my brother? So I, I think I just waited. It was it was sort of getting light by this point because it, it was a lot of faffing about, like the battle, getting all the gear and all that kind of stuff. Um I I rang my brother. He was on the two and three. I haven't mentioned that. He was fishing on the other side of the road. And he'd been hauling. He'd had about three fish in the night. And he was like, yeah, they're boshing all over me. And I I was like, I can't really ask him to come over here. I could have asked him, but my brother doesn't get a lot of time to go fishing. And I I felt like it was a bit selfish to ask him to like wind in. You know what I mean? Like he was having a bit of a red letter trip himself. Yeah. Um, So I was like, right, I'm going to have to go and tell this geezer. And, and he's at this guy, he's up at bloody first light looking at the water. So I've, I've walked up there and I'm like, how do mate? Yeah. Um, and I'm soaking wet. He probably knew I had one. Um, and it, I was like, I've, basically I've got one, you know, like, would you mind taking my photos in an hour or so when it gets light? Um, mm. And he was like, yeah, sure. Um, and at that point it's tricky because you, you know, like you don't know how good people are taking photos. Yeah, that's the worst thing. You can have all the kit and all the knowledge. Yeah. But you're then giving it to someone else, aren't you? <laughs> exactly. And I, <laughs> when I'd fished a two and three, um, I'd fished on my own and I, I didn't tell, I, I, I didn't really tell anyone what I was catching ever. So I'd mastered mm. self-takes because I used to, I was literally like folding my wet net down and, and getting my second net out and like putting my wet sling under my bed or well, probably not my bed under my barrow because over there like if people know you're catching they'll jump on the gate the next day and beat you in the swim um and but i i just felt the fish was too big um to to do on my own safely mm-hmm. do you know what i mean with the self-take yeah, kit and i was like i have to swallow like my desire to not tell anyone for the for the sake of the fish and mm-hmm. Long, you know, like we weighed it, um, it was 39.4. So we weighed it 39.4, done some photos, and it was like, it was glorious, mate. It was proper, like, sunshine, you know, like when it, them spring mornings where it's clear yeah. and just beautiful sun, like, got some lovely shots in the sun. Whenever I look at them, I always smile and I just think, like, that was such a great morning. <laughs> um, and I said to him, like, look, man, me and you, like, you, we've been up here and I hadn't really mentioned this, but in May prior to, uh, we're in June here now, in May it had been quite busy because someone caught that fish the year before and it, and it ended up on the front page of Carp Talk or, or <laughs> Carp World or something. And the Lockwood yeah. had attracted like a load of attention. Um, and people were just starting to die off. The nights in May, yeah. one night there was eight yeah. people on the Lockie, which is like unheard of. But you know, like that, people go up there and they do one trip and they just think like fuck this this is this is yeah. this is mad which it kind of is um i only fished it because i had that window at the start and then i got and then i, I couldn't give it up um so you see a lot of people come and go and at this point i mean there was only four of us on that night because steve turned up late uh, and one of one guy was a regular and i said to him look if don't tell no one mate if you don't tell anyone no one will be up here and, and we can carry on and i said if you tell anyone um obviously people will get back up here yeah. and it's a bit hit and miss when you tell people that i mean you can't tell someone not to tell them at the end of the day it's up to them yeah. isn't it um and i have to i have to say like a massive thank you to the steve here for not he didn't tell a soul which <laughs> matt like just led the, the next part of the story um is only due to the fact that he didn't tell anyone and other people didn't get up there because he was like very much a family man fishing. He'd only come like once or twice a month and yeah. really everyone dropped off and, I, and, and there was just no one up there. Um, right. So I had the patch. Shall I just carry on? 
Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, I had the patch first of June, and um, I done. Um, I know I done. So basically, being the bailiff at, at the stow, I was allowed to fish nights whenever I wanted, right? During those three months, and um, I think a lot of people thought I done a hell of a lot of nights, um, which I didn't. And that people definitely thought this because, like, there were rumors floating around. Like, one of my favorites was that um, when I finished my shift at 10 p.m., I spod peanuts till midnight and then I fish all night and I'm having like 10 <laughs> fish a night. And I, <laughs> and, and um, I was kind of like, guys, anyone who knows me knows I'm dead lazy. And all I do is just catapult kilos of boilies like 30 yards out. You know, I don't, I hate spotting. So that's just a blatant yeah. lie. Um, but I did do a couple of swerve. I did a couple of swervy. In, in total, I did um, eight nights on the Lockwood last year. And right. f- four were like legitimate nights um, where everyone was there. And, and the other four were just like nights when I was allowed to go up there. Um, so I didn't actually do that much because I was like, I w- because I was in such a good position, I was really picking and choosing like when I wanted to fish. Um, I did a couple yeah. of nights around that kind of area after that. And it was just standard Lockwood, didn't see, didn't hear, absolute nothing, you know. Like, I managed to really piss off some people doing one of the nights. They saw me and um, right. someone took a photograph of me, like, bivvied up at five to nine <laughs> and was, like, circulating it around saying, like, oh, this, you know, he's living up there. Um, <laughs> yeah, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Uh, as, as it goes. Um, and then really, like, I think it was about, it was about, I'd say about 10 days after the patch common, we'd had those, I don't know if you've noticed on, but in the last two or three springs, we've just had these devil east, uh, not eastern, these northern leaves. Yeah, it's been, we don't get standard seasons, do we? Like classical seasons are out the window. Yeah, cla- yeah, definitely. It's just, yeah, like even like this winter just gone, it wasn't a winter, was it? it was, yeah, it's odd. It's not like it used to be, is it? No, d- definitely not, man. And I've just noticed that in in May, in April, May, and even into the start, we just keep getting like tons of northern leaves. And the mm-hmm. reason I've, I mean, I come to that conclusion because I fished on the Lockwood both of those springs and northern leaves are cold. And like I sat on the end of a lot of cold northern leaves, extremely hopeful. And all I got was like wind burn and chap lips. Um, <laughs> and it had been blowing northern leaf for um, ages, like about nine or 10 days after I caught that, the, uh, the patch. Um, and it turned, it was due to turn around to a southerly and it was that kind of weather, you know, that kind of weather that everyone wants, like the typical, yeah, which we're going to get now in lockdown, aren't we? The the first warm winds, first warm winds. Yeah. And it it was even dosed in with like low pressure, yeah, (laughs) (laughs) big winds, like, you know, proper conditions. And I was like, Mm. yeah, I've got to get up there then. Um, (laughs) uh, and I remember Whatever day it was, it turned. It was the day it was due to turn, and uh, you know when it, it goes flat calm before it turns round, and you it's yeah. like super amplified on big pits. And I was yeah. I was working, and I went up there on my shift, um, like right at the end of my shift, like no, nothing happens at the end of the shift. So I went up there, and um, it was flat calm. And I, basically, long story short, I've got this huge saucepan which I bought, um, I think it's, I don't know what it's for cooking, but I don't know what, honestly, it's so big that if you put it on a normal stove, it covers all four hobs. And I was so excited because I'd just got this bailiff job. I'd gone to the farm shop and I think like the key thing is I'd been, I'd been geeing up for like a year long campaign on the Lockwood. Like that's why I bought the power barrel. I bought the RXs. I'd bought a um, hundred kilos, I think of dry particle, maize and maples. Like, <laughs> like 60 70 kilos of nutcracker I, do you know what i mean i proper i was like i want everything i'm, I'm going for it <laughs> <laughs> so ott and yeah. i was um what i was doing when i was getting to work i was boiling my particle at work because we had a stove in the office um <laughs> and i just had these i had sacks of baits in the container and i was so excited because i just got the job i was just every day i was boiling up like five ten kilos of particle and i was mm. just throwing it everywhere like i was throwing it in the copper mill i was throwing it in, i weren't even fishing the two and three i was throwing it in i was just like yeah i'm gonna bait this i'm gonna bait this swim for months and then you know like all that crazy all these crazy ideas you have yeah. and all of a sudden i was kind of in this position where i could pull it off and like i'd boiled up so much particle the day before it was a joke 
and uh, I couldn't even throw it all in. And it was all on the back of the truck. And like, I went up there and I was kind of thinking, mm, shall I fish tonight? Um, and I decided against it because I thought, you know what, tomorrow night looks the better night because the wind's really going to get stronger throughout the day. Um, so basically, I thought, let me, I'll put a bit of bait in. And I, I think you, you must be out and, um, you must know what I mean. You know, when you start putting bait in and you just turn around and you're like, bloody hell, I've put quite a bit in here. Um, I pulled out, I had about three, four kilos of boilies in the truck. They all went in. And then I thought, oh, I put a little bit of particle because, you know, like it get them grubbing around. And I had this huge bucket, like God knows how many kilos were in there. And I had, all I had was my landing net pile with a scoop. And I was just yeah. slinging it like as far as I could get it. And it was landing sort of where it's about 10 foot of water. Right. So I give it a good hit of bait, probably like 10, 15 K. And, um, next day I done my shift and it was uh, late and I, I finished my shift and I got up there and it was just one of them nights where, you know, where like everything goes wrong. Um, like for example, yeah. when I got my rods out, one, one or two hooks were blunt, one rig, uh, the coated bit was all meshed up in the middle and it was just like it was proper aggro it took me ages to sort it all out i had to tie new rigs and and whatnot and yeah i did i got the rods out so like again four rods blasted around the tower two on each side of the tower um like i'm bivvied up in the middle they're like closest to maybe 20 30 yards and the furthest to like 50 yards at either side of me mm-hmm. and um it's basically a similar story to the to the patch in which that uh, I was just, I remember it was really late. I stayed up like super late. I was reading a book and um, I got like one beep. And, but this time it was no like liner. It's just a continual like beep, beep, beep. And um, I, again, but I'm not going to lie. I was just in disbelief. And like I was, I started running towards where the rod was. And I remember it was so far away that I actually got to the point where I couldn't hear my sander box, but I couldn't hear the alarm. And I was like in the middle thinking, oh, like, has it fallen off? Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I'm like just running and running and running. And, and I, had to cro- I had to jump over this big pipe. And I eventually got there. It's just melting. And, um, I, yeah, like I picked the rod up. And there was the, the cast had gone a lot closer to the tower than I would normally like to fish. Because um, there was these basically these huge, huge winds. Um, oh, is, it, is the sound still all right here, Dom? Yeah, 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 I can hear you. Um, yeah, there was these huge winds. And as I'd, I'd done a bit of a loopy cast, really, and the wind had basically just massively caught my rig and taken it um, taken it really close to the tower. And yeah. sometime before, the lock would have been drained right down. And we got some pictures of, like, what was around these towers. And basically, yeah. there was um, all manner of, like, underground pipes and stuff under there. Right. So you know, like when you you pick the rod up and you're like, I've got to like get it away from that tower quick because there's, mm. I don't know, there's all concrete blocks and whatnot. Um, mm. And I gave the fish quite a bit of stick straight away, swung it out, and then all of a sudden it was like proper hell broke loose. It's just ripping line off, um, mm. and it was a bit like you know, like in proper biblical conditions, like massive wind, drizzle in the air. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm the only one there and I'm just like, fucking hell, I'm attached to another one. Like, I can't believe it. Um <laughs> I'm trying to remember. I know that all I can really remember, because it's always a bit sketchy, was I I tried to put the brakes on it and literally it just the rod just hooped and like I had to let go. <laughs> and I was thinking, yeah, this is this is another big fish. Um it come in and it boiled up about 30 yards out. I see it as a common and I started to think, fucking hell, like, it's the big common. You know, like what are the odds of having the patch again 10 days later? Mm. Um, it boiled up and this like, big old shoulder come out the water. I was like, and the, the lock were common. It's a big like barrel thing, you know what I mean? And I just see yeah. the big shoulder and I was like, oh my God, it's the common. It's definitely the common. <laughs> and as I was sort of like just thinking, oh my God, it's just dropped down and swung left, like started kiting and round to the left of me, there's this like big brick wall that goes out in the water. And it's designed mm. to break the, um, break the wave. So it doesn't erode mm-hmm. the, the end of the Lockwood. 
because like yeah. the reservoirs have to be designed in a way that they don't get eroded so that because that, if, if that reservoir broke like you know what i mean it would yeah. cause devastation um yeah. and it started swinging towards this thing and you know like i knew what fish it was and you don't want to have to like give it the uh what what did the uh, thing you call it give it the butt yeah so <laughs> i've had to give it the butt and i'm like nah like this is bad you know what i mean because if it gets there this this is like these huge rocks in a metal cage is prime snag you up or cut you off material and i've just give it the butt and lo and behold it just couldn't have gone any better in hindsight because it was kiting to my left the fish just kited even more to the left and come up through the water and was just kind of there wallowing to my left yeah and it was just like defeated and i was like Ah oh, yes. So again, like usual, jumped in the lake. Like well, I walked into the lake, um, and I got it in the net with with relative ease. Um, yeah, man. And then I just remember looking down and thinking, like, fucking hell, that's the Lockwood Common. That's that's the that's the myth. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. And would you say you were the only one there? Yeah. So literally, I was the only one there. Um, How did the photos go down with that one? Well, um, after like a lot of swearing, a lot of screaming and shouting, um, (laughs) realizing I was about 60, 70 yards off my gear, I I, I was like, I'm not leaving this one here. And I I waded it all the way down the margin, like (laughs) walked fucking 60, 70 yards with the fish to my left in the deep water, making sure it's upright. I got it all the way to the swim. And like one thing I'll never forget is between where I was and where I dropped the, not dropped the fish, but just like left the net, um, was stinging nettles. Right. And I was running through these stinging nettles, like backwards and forwards, trying to get it (laughs) sacked up and stuff. And, Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know, but my legs were just getting stung to pieces because I had shorts and Crocs on. Yeah. And it was only like after I sacked it up and stuff. Um, the my, adrenaline wore off. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, the adrenaline wears off. My legs, they, they started burning. And um, <laughs> I started to think like, man, is was there some chemicals in the water? <laughs> like, So I, I'm boiling the kettle and I'm washing my legs and I'm hand sanitizing my legs and they're literally <laughs> burning, right? <laughs> I'm thinking, oh my God, like there's something in the water and like uh, – something's happened here like this is proper bad what am I going to do like I'm not going to hospital because I've got this fish like I'll have to deal with it and then after about 10 minutes I started to see all these bumps appearing on my legs and then I've, I've realized oh, I've been stung by stinging that was like 2,000 times um, and yeah in terms of just to answer your question I, I rang my brother and I was just like mate I need you to come do some photos and um <laughs> Bless him. He was just like, "Why have you got the common?" I was like, "Yeah, I've got it, mate. Like, it's time to come." <laughs> um, and right down at the far end of the Lockwood, there's another gate which just goes out into like a housing estate, which I had the key for. So mm. um, he turned up, um, came in. Obviously, you know, like we had waited for like the light to be pucker, picked the spot mm. where we wanted to photograph it and stuff. And um, yeah, we got some really. He done me proud on the camera, man. He got some wicked Brilliant. shots. You've probably seen them, right? Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll stick them up as well so people can see. Yeah, and definitely. Yeah, he proper yeah. done me proud. Um, and then yeah, it was really funny. He he filmed the whole thing on his GoPro on like a chess mount, but basically right. he had it pointing at the floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in the end, all we got was. Uh, just loads of swearing, like loads and loads of swearing, yeah. like fuck, you know, look at it, look at it, it's so, it's so big, it's so dark, and 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 like the only other thing that's like a bit interesting was like when I opened the sack, um, well he opened the sack, and I remember he took a photo of the fish, and I was like, mate, there's all dirt on it, clean it off, and um, he goes, oh, that's not dirt, that's bait, and I like as I looked at it, it was just smothered in like um, well like boily maples and maize, so. <laughs> Obviously, they'd been there just absolutely devouring the uh, the big hit of bait. Yeah. Yeah, then, then yeah. post, like, you know, like jumped in the lake, got some water shots, slung her back. She went back fine, or he went back fine, I think. Um, mm. And then at that point, I was a bit of a, like, um, I didn't know which way to go because, like, I'd had the fish I wanted and um, you know what it's like. Like, do I stay yeah. or do I go? And I was kind of thinking, do you know what? Like, there's there's a big mirror in there. It's going to be the next one out, and they're coming out. So I think it's actually worth sticking on. Yeah. 
And basically, I, I was like, I've got the tactics now. I've I've done this massive hit of bait, um, and like that, on a brand new wind, this worked. And like, long yeah. story short, I, I did it. I did it again, and it didn't work. I done it on a westerly, and I blanked. And then mm-hmm. about a week or two later, I, there was the wind swung from like consistent south southerlies and westerlies to to a northerly. Yeah. And I went back to the original spot where I caught the patch, which was on the end of like a northeasterly. And the day mm-hmm. before. I hit it with so much bait. I've never put so much bait in a lake before ever. Like three <laughs> buckets, you know, like the big buckets, which are comfortable to sit on. Yeah, the big tall ones. Yeah, yeah. three of them yeah. with like full of maize and maples all glugged up in molasses and good five, <laughs> six kilos of boilies. Um, and at this point, like basically the locals just absolutely hated me. They they were thought I was living up there or living on the complex at night. And I had two days off work and I was like, do you know what? Fuck them. I'm going to go up there and I'm just going to do a 48 hour. I'm going to blase it. Like they hate me anyway. They think I'm doing it. I might as well just do it. Yeah. Um, I baited up the next day. I got down there and it was mad because I, I so nearly didn't even go up there because I'd been trying to get permission to fish like another reservoir. And that day when I turned up, I got permission to fish that lake. Like my, uh, my boss said, oh, I've got some really good news for you. I've, you can go and fish the um, this lake, and I was like, "Oh, I'm going to go straight up there." But the thing was, you, you had we, the only way I was allowed to fish it because it was so deemed so dangerous by Thames was in pairs mm-hmm. um, with yeah. like life jackets and stuff. And um, right. my mate didn't want to come. My mate was like, "Nah, I don't want to go. Like, we need to bait it up first. Blah blah blah." And I spent like 15 minutes trying to convince him, but basically couldn't. So I thought, "Oh, sod it. I'm just going to go and do my 48 up the locky." Um, and I went up there, flicked out f- four singles over like this hundred yards or so that I'd spread this bait, literally sat down, made a cup of tea, put a pizza on in the Ridge Monkey and, uh, and I just had a take in like 25, 30 minutes. Um, I was like, what? No way. <laughs> Obviously by this point, um, I wasn't surprised like, you know, with the beeping yeah. and, yeah. um, that was really cool, man. I, like, I got it in with, with relative ease. It fought really well, um, but nothing of note really to say. Like, I jumped in the lake mm. like always, netted it up, and it turned out to be the, the last big one in there, the, the big mirror, which um, <laughs> was really nice. Like, my, one of, like, my friends, a couple of my mates were there. They filmed me playing it in, and then we weighed it. It was 43.10 or 43.8. I can't remember. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, would, I suppose just tracking back to the common, that was like we weighed that. That was forty six, which was his biggest ever weight yeah. at the time. Wow. Yeah. yeah, and it was just kind of like I can't believe it. You know, I've gone for in like twenty three <laughs> days, I've gone from nothing to catching the three biggest. It was pretty mad. <laughs> wow, but there, there's a lot of effort involved in that as well, isn't it? It's all sort of building, isn't it? And you, you would, you didn't give up you learn and sort of adapted and took note of what worked and used it. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Like there was, oh, there was even in like, even in those, like, that 24 day period, there was loads of effort involved. Mm. Like I was walking it constantly. And I think like with the Lockwood in it, at first I almost hated it because it was so difficult, but by the end of it, I kind of found like this weird beauty within it. And yeah, I just, like a perverse, yeah, you have to go back, yeah. Yeah, exactly, like that. Yeah. And I just I just began to like love it. And the fact that mm. from catching the patch to catching the mirror, um, I think I only saw two people like right. at all. And so everyone else had given up and it was just perfect. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I suppose like to get those free fish as your free bites is um yeah is somewhat <laughs> lucky. <the> <laughs> <laughs> wow, well, that is a hell of a story. I, I said um I had a feeling it'd be a good story and yeah, well happy with that. So we're on an hour, nearly an hour and a half already. Um what I'll do obviously we we've, we've finished on that that note, it's a, a mega one. I've got a question that I need to add to the end. Mm-hmm. Um that says like the rotary style, yours from our last guest, which was Adam Pedding, and that's basically, if there was no fishing, what would be your thing? What would be your leisure pursuit or what would be your pastime hobby? Um, uh, that's a good question. Uh, he's I'll probably asked that because he knows it's a difficult one to answer. Um, I, for years, <laughs> I've trained judo and Brazilian jiu-jitsu, so I'll probably have to go with that. Um, right. 
I'd have to go with that because the the jujitsu and fishing are just massive conflicts of interest. Like you, you need to dedicate all your time to both mm-hmm. of them because you know if you're not yeah. training every week in the gym, when you go, you get beaten up. Um, yeah. So yeah, if I didn't have fishing, I would. Yeah, I'd have to do that, I suppose. Yeah, no, awesome. That's a good answer. And have you thought of any question that you can put to our next guest, whoever that might be? Yeah, I think um, I would. I always like uh, like I've read loads of books. All, like, all the old school books about, you know, like the old fish like Mary and um, mm-hmm. all the car park fish. So I think I'd, I'd, if I were going to ask someone a question, I'd say, um, if you could have been, if you could be behind the lens for a particular capture, any capture in history, which one would it be and why? Awesome. I hope that's, I hope that's all right. Yeah, I love that. I'm jotting it down as we speak. I love that, obviously, with my, because I enjoy photography. That's amazing, mate. Um, yeah, we've hit like an hour and a half, and I really appreciate your time on this one. People will love it. I know that. We'd love a story, especially <laughs> in these weird times where we're all locked down and we can't get out. Yeah. Um, there'll be a lot of fires lit after listening to that. So, Lewis, mate, I think we'll wrap up there. That's been brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dom. And, yeah, hopefully um, it provides some solace for someone or another in lockdown because, obviously, I'm the same as everyone. I'm desperate to get out, and it's killing me softly. Yeah, no, absolutely. Right, take care, mate, yep. and we'll, we'll see you soon. Thanks for having me on, dude. Take care.